Good morning. Good morning. It is, uh, I'm confused between April and May. It's April 30th, 30th and it will be May 1st tomorrow. <laughs> and you can hear in the background what lo sounds like tornado winds. So if every now and then we duck, you'll know it's because there's, there's heavy, heavy winds here. <laughs> we have here. tornado yeah. warnings right now, yes. I've heard that there's actually something going on, like they call it global warming or something like that. I just, <laughs> I just heard about it recently, which may have an impact on our weather. So, Well, uh, one of the things we're talking about today is vulnerability and uh, how that can be. Uh, it's, a, it's a natural experience when we have something like this, a tornado threatening us. Uh, but, you know, life is, is threatening. And so uh, vulnerability is something we all experience. We're going to talk about what to do about that. But let's start with an opening prayer. Sure. So let's come together. Let's come together and know the truth about ourselves, about life. And what we know is that we are one with the almighty power of God, of the universe, whatever you want to call it, creative energy. We know that this energy is always creating all by itself in nature and through us in our lives. So our, when we have a vulnerable experience, we need that to remind us to know the truth about ourselves, which is that we identify with that part of us that is divine, that is powerful, that has all possibilities in the wake with creativity as its essence. And so as we remember that, we remember that life is eternal. Uh, we cannot be lost to the universe. We cannot die, we simply transition. And so we know that every moment we're here, we are creating our experience. So we choose to focus on our connection with the divine, that we are creative beings, that we know the highest and the best is unfolding for us. So we give thanks, we release this to the universe, and together we say, and, and so, so it, is. it is. It was interesting, Bob and I were just talking this morning because our title is Vulnerability, uh, what is our time? Vulnerability, something and possibility. Power and possibility. Yeah. Vulnerability, power and possibility. It's a memory thing. <laughs> yes, it's a memory thing. And so, uh, you know, as as uh, metaphysicians, we get used to not paying attention to vulnerabilities and go right to affirming and knowing uh, the eternal truth about ourselves. And yet we all, as human beings, we all will feel vulnerable at one time or another. This, all we have to do is look around and see amongst our family, some are sick, some are in pain, some, some pass away, as we say, or, or, or we usually say make their transition to the other uh, part of our life, which is our spiritual part. But nevertheless, you know, and of course you grow up and you hear things like it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you know, which puts us right smack in with wild animals. So it's natural that we're going to feel vulnerable. And so uh, this teaching, this metaphysical teaching, teaches us what to do in circumstances like that for the very best outcome for ourselves. Well, we need to think of vulnerability uh, in, in, in a way maybe different than we have before. 10.33 a.m. <laughs> okay. We so, know the time. Somebody's got it, right. <laughs> And in a way different. Anybody have any idea how far the monarch butterflies fly to get to their location in, in Monterey area? I think they fly from Mexico. They, they, they fly a huge distance. And what's interesting is that their vulnerability is their strength. Their vulnerability is their lightness, their ability to be carried by the wind, to, to get into the currents where they don't have to, to fly like geese do, uh, which wears them out and costs them huge amounts of energy. So what on the one hand is a vulnerability, on the other hand is, is a power or as an asset or as a strength. And I would ask you to look today at what you, what you call your vulnerabilities and ask yourself, is this also really a strength? Is there a strength in this vulnerability? Uh, you know, personal story, I, I grew up unfortunately not knowing that I was dyslexic, so I actually thought I was just dumb. And I was told I was dumb, mm -hmm. which was, a, which, which was a, a point of view that it took me a long time to overcome. It wasn't true, but because it was a point of view that I held, it was a vulnerability I believed that was real. I didn't see any assets in that, but I also didn't see myself as capable of, 
uh, intelligent language or doing any of the things that I've done over the last few years. But what, it, what is Im important to me is to look at that and ask yourself, what has it caused you to do that you wouldn't have done or that other people wouldn't do? So for instance, uh, I became a public speaker and I never needed notes. And the reason I didn't need notes is because when I stood in front of people, I couldn't read notes. <laughs> so it was, Oh, and tell them about the stutter. Oh yeah, I stuttered really, really badly. And uh, uh, and so, but again, it, 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 it wasn't a liability as much as I thought it was because it made me a listener. It made me an observer. It meant I didn't belong in many situations where other people seemed to belong. And so this, this disadvantage, this thing that, that seemed to cause a lot of pain also caused a lot of growing, a lot of learning. In addition to, I learned how not to stutter, which was uh, by itself an interesting thing. I began to pay attention to voice, to speaking, to the sound, intonation, delivery, all of those things that many people don't pay attention to. To this day now, if I hear an actor you know, in a movie and don't even see him, I can tell you who it is. And I can tell you because of voice recognition. So that was a strength or a power that I developed as a result of what you would call a vulnerability. So I, I don't want to stretch it out too long. But, but well, not I, to mention making a living as a professional speaker. Yes, right. Or, or professional writer who can't spell. Yeah. Or professional artist who's never had an art lesson, right? Tell the story about uh, your art teacher. Oh, yes, yeah, so Mr. Geopolis. What, what uh, grade yeah, were you yeah. in? I think I was in probably fifth grade. And Mr. Geopolis, he was six foot seven and very Greek. He said, I want you all to draw a tree. Well, I was already a junior audiophile at the age of 15, meaning that I was already designing speaker enclosures so I could have better sound in my house or in my room. And so uh, he came over to my desk and said, what are you drawing? I said, I'm drawing an acoustical labyrinth, which is a particular kind of a speaker enclosure. He said, go to the principal's office. I don't want you in this class. If you can't follow instructions, you're out of here, you're done. And so I went to the principal's office and that was my last art course. <laughs> 30 years later, whatever, uh, I'm having a one man show in a beautiful gallery on, a, in, on Park Avenue where it, it's the prestige area of, of the city. Of and, Rochester. Of Rochester, yeah, Park Avenue. And, and it was definitely the best. Anyway, everybody came. Uh, the Shah of Iran came, that's how long ago it was, with his entourage. Judy uh, or uh, Barbara Walters sent flowers and said she was sorry she couldn't make it. And uh, in walks Mr. Geopolis, and I couldn't help but see him because he was so tall. And as he came up and he, was, he said, I am so proud of you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're the only student I've ever had that's really succeeded <laughs> and, uh, in art. And he showed me a scrapbook that he had created of me and all of the articles written about me and all the prizes that I'd gotten as an artist. And I didn't have the heart to tell him, you threw me out of your class. I was in one class with you. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it didn't deter me from becoming an artist or from designing speaker enclosures for better sound. But why was that? Why was what? Why were you not discouraged by the teachers that called you dumb and and uh, all I, of that? I was. I, I was very discouraged. Oh, you were. You were affected. <laughs> it was awful. By it. Yeah. And <laughs> and there's there's that inner voice. There's that inner knowing that says there's something more to you than that. And I don't I don't know. I I really do believe we have guardian angels, and I really believe the angelic intelligence that's in the universe that comes here with us when we are born into this physical world is here to support us and actually does. And mm -hmm. there's been a lot of times when I felt that. I know, and I, I've shared this before, when I, I, I took my portfolio to a gallery on Park Avenue, the one that I eventually showed in, and uh, I showed my portfolio to the gallery owner and he looked at it and he said, are you famous? And I said, uh, what do you mean am I famous? He said, are you famous? I said, well, no. And he said, we'll come back when you are. I said, well, how will I get famous? He said, well, that'll be your problem to solve, won't it? <laughs> Closed my portfolio and walked away. I was crushed. We are crushed when we find our vulnerability. We are crushed mm -hmm. when we find something we can't do. And it was like, I can't believe this. I've been drawing, I've been drawing, I've been drawing. I like what I do, I'm passionate about it. And this guy says to me, come back when you're famous. I got nothing I can do. So for two weeks, I didn't draw. And, and I, I don't think I even spoke to anybody. I was so miserable because of the pain. And then I went to a print store and I had cards printed and the cards said, Robert Luckin, famous artist. And uh, I thought, I'm going to hold on to that idea. I'm going to grow that idea. And so I went across the street to a gallery there, a lesser gallery. I showed him my card. He laughed. I said, are you really famous? I said, no, but he said, well, it could happen. Gave me a show. And a year later, I bought the gallery across the street and fired the manager who told me to come back when I was famous. <laughs> And I had a one-man show there and many more shows to after, after that. And I mean, who knows, even today, my work, today on CBS Sunday morning, my work will be being shown again. 
So am I a famous artist, sort of? Yeah. Yeah. So what I'd like to point out, because of what we want to share today, is that we all feel vulnerable at yes. times, and that what we need to do is identify, not with this scared uh, human self, but with the part of us that is one with God, that is divine, and that that power works through us. So we go to where the power is, mm -hmm. uh, and and there's unlimited power available. And and so the way we go to the power, sometimes we don't even know what the possibilities are, yeah. but we know that it's possible to get through this, to even... Uh, be more successful because of it or happy or whatever the goal might be uh, that's one of the possibilities so it it really opens the door the, the challenge the we might call it a problem there's a problem but it's also a challenge and the challenge is what are the possibilities and could you focus on that if you knew that the power works through you right you know and so as you know this I I was a young I was a young mother when I first learned this teaching. I was always worried about uh, my kids, especially one who was uh, was always getting sick and had six hospitalizations by the time he was three. So I was always worried about him. And so the teaching comes to my awareness and says, you don't want to spend your time worrying because you're actually, you're creating, you're manifesting the very thing you don't want. So instead, you need to think of possibilities, of other possibilities. And of course, I you, you go to the ideal and what you would like to see happen. And so I would focus on wellness. I would see him as well. I would tell him he was healthy. I, I just always focused on that. And anytime I worried, I would flip that or pivot is another way of saying, just turn your attention to the opposite or what you want to see. And, and there are all kinds of possibilities. Sometimes they surprise you. Sometimes there are surprises that you hadn't even thought of. But uh, you might even say, I, I want the opposite of this, the wellness, the wholeness, the, uh, the ideal. And, and that happens, sometimes circuitously, sometimes instantly. Uh, you really never know. Uh, one of our, our uh, practitioners has said that uh, you don't expect a miracle, but you expect the miraculous. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it comes in steps. That reminds me of something that I discovered a long time ago in ministry and and in doing prayer, what we call treatment here. Treatment meaning we actually treat the condition with our mental capacity, our mental spiritual capacity. And one of the things that I would say to somebody who was very, very ill is, is there anybody that you can think of that's ever had this illness that you have or this trouble that you have that got better? And I can tell you that for every disease there is that people have died from, somebody had that disease and didn't die. If somebody had that disease and didn't die, would you be willing to hold on to that idea rather than the idea that you'd love to be healed from this disease, but you're going to die from it? <laughs> and you can't have both and expect one to work over the other. They're going to cancel each other out. You're going to have to get to that point where you're willing to believe that a miraculous thing could happen because beyond understanding and explanation, something has happened. Now, I want to share a piece of this that's, that I think is a, a real catch for us. We try to figure things out. We try to figure out a cause and effect relationship. And the reason that we try to figure things out is because it gives us a sense of control. It gives us a sense of power over the condition. If I can figure out what happened, if I can figure out what I did. So we automatically go to things like, why me? Why did this happen to me? What's wrong with me? What have I got to do? Wrong question, wrong pursuit. But it's what we're doing to feel we have some power over a condition that we feel powerless over. Another way of approaching that is to say, I am powerless over figuring this out but I'm not powerless over the outcome that I would like to see happen as a result of the treatment that I'm going to do. What I know is that there's lots of ways to do a thing and I can do it with the help of others without having to understand all the machinery. When I get into my car in the morning and I turn the key, I don't have to understand the ignition, I don't have to understand the motor, I don't have to understand combustion or how it works. All I have to do is know if I do the right things, those things will happen. It will be miraculous and my car will move. I think we often, in our society in particular, spend so much time trying to figure out what's wrong in order to have a feeling of control over it that we forget that it's a condition and that all conditions mm -hmm. can change and we can change any condition. 
And, and, and the conditions often are teachers as well. So we can not only have a condition, but we don't have the condition have to have us. And we can learn from that and we can teach from that. Exactly. Um, I was thinking that, you know, when this teaching really was big and popular, uh, we call it new thought. And, and uh, It's funny because it was really an old thought. But... It was really ancient <clears throat> wisdom. Uh, and it started with Christian science in this country and uh, this kind of mental healing that happens uh, with practitioners who learn to do this for people. And, and then um, the students of that, some broke away and unity uh, came into existence, unity churches, and then divine science and then religious science, which was our uh, original name. We changed it because we kept getting confused with Scientology. And so we're and we're not. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, there were all kinds of miraculous healings that happened. People did not have much confidence in doctors at that time in the 1800s. And uh, doctors were often considered quacks because they, they did quacky things, <laughs> quacky treatments. And a lot of people didn't trust them at all, especially people who lived out in the country, farms and whatnot. They had to learn to take care of themselves. They learned, learned how to stitch themselves up when they got cut. You know, they were very independent when it came to their health. And um, there are many stories of people breaking bones and being healed by practitioners of this teaching because uh, they did not consider it impossible. Right. I mean, either the people with the broken bone or the, or the practitioners of this healing art. And um, as a matter of fact, there's a story by, uh, oh, I can't think of names right now, but a um, famous, who's the famous writer that wrote about the frogs, the funny writer? Very, anyway. very, very popular, very, very wealthy, actually, became very wealthy. Um, uh, but at any rate, he, he, was, he was healed by a, a practitioner of a broken bone. And he said to him or her, now, let's see, you said that, uh, oh, oh I, hate, I hate it when I forget a story. You said that, uh, that there was no truth. That's one of the things we say, there's no truth to that. And what we mean by truth is it's not spiritually the truth. Uh, it is physically the truth, but it's not spiritually the truth. So he said to her, so you said that, or him, I don't know who the practitioner was, you said that there was no truth to this. and, and he, the practitioner agreed. Yes, there was no truth to it. Uh, then there was no. There's no truth to the payment that you were expecting either, is there? <laughs> so it's supposed to be funny, but <laughs> it, 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 it was close. It was, it was a, when I tell you, you skipped a it couple was, lines. Yeah. Uh, well, since yeah. we're on the not remember people's names, there's a, a, a book that I really very much appreciate and admire. And I, if you ever have a chance to get it, uh, I would recommend it. It's called The Hell I Can't. Mm. And I can't think of the author's name either, who's a practitioner and does lectures all over. But what I liked is a particular thing that he did. And see, since we're so big on figuring things out, we have to find a way to go around that, that, that figuring things out. And so what he did, which is he would say, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if tomorrow when I wake up, the condition that I'm struggling with or I'm suffering from is completely gone. I wouldn't be at all surprised if I got better every day rather than worse. He opened the door to and he invited in the possibility of a new way of thinking, of a different way of seeing a thing without having to have an argument. The problem when you say is, I've got to be able to explain it to be able to have it. You've already lost it. And so what he was saying is, I can't explain the miracles that happen. I can't explain why I've had as many diseases and illnesses that I've had. And I can't explain how I healed all of them while I was in the hospital and I was supposed to die from them. But we have to be willing to have a place for I don't know and not have it be I don't know, therefore it can't happen. We have to say I don't know how it happens. I don't know how the universe works. There's a lot I don't understand. And I am in the position to create great miracles just because I say so because that's my decision, because that's the power of my decision. The man I was trying to think of was Mark Twain. Oh, yeah. He's pretty, he was Mark pretty successful. <laughs> he was very successful. <laughs> and, and he was a humor writer, but I believe that was a true story. Yeah. Um, I'm not positive. And you can't think of the other author. Well, 
I was so busy trying to remember Mark yeah. Twain. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> in about 10 minutes after we're done here, in, oh, there it is, yes. We'll find it in our bookshelf. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he healed himself of... Of a lot of different... I mean, Many, just, many, many operations yeah. and whatnot. So, uh, what I want to share with you is a, a quote from our founder, Ernest Holmes. And he said... In transforming energy into power, he's talking about like uh, wind energy or, or uh, turbine energy, we are uniting an invisible essence with an invisible law, which is the way the universe operates. So that's important to remember. It's an invisible uh, essence, that's the capital E, meaning power of God, with an invisible law. We call it the law of mind, um, or the law of cause and effect, which is the way the universe operates. If we identify ourselves with the source, then our word establishes, our word meaning our, our thoughts, our statements, establishes eternal harmony, transforms everything, rearranges everything to benefit. It is an act of complete surrender of the human to the divine, Without the loss of the human, a complete inflowing of the divine into the human. So when we do this type of healing and this type of prayer, because it may not be about health, you know, it could be about um, finances, it could be about our jobs, our, our creative self-expression, it could be about money. Did I say that? Mm -hmm. I don't remember if I did or not. But... Uh, we do this kind of affirmative prayer for all these things. And it, it really helps you out of that vulnerability because you go from the vulnerability to the possibilities and um, by way of the power, which is the power of God in us. Now, uh, that's really, really important. And with what I shared with you, I think it was a week before last, but a little bit last week, when I was talking about the, the new way of operating with your full brain that Jill Bolt Taylor is recommending. As a matter of fact, the new book is called, um, <laughs> I'm looking over there at my book, uh, Full full Brain, um, Full Brain Usage or Living. And she, this is my left side. I don't know how it looks on your screen, but this is my left side. So when she divides that up to the upper the left and right hemispheres this one the left one you usually hear more about uh, but so when we start worrying when we start getting scared that's the emotional part that's the left side of your brain we go right up to the top part which is the worry part oh my god what if you know and all that and and then when we remember the when we identify with the divine within us with the god part within us then we start thinking of solutions, and that's a way to get over into the right brain, which um, is, is going to also be thinking, but it's thinking more uh, in universal terms, all of us connecting <clears throat> holistically. And whole brain living is the name of the book, whole brain living. And once you get to that part, you can also get to the right part, which is she calls love or God because this is a feeling part too. So you can be relieved, you can just feel relieved and not uh, not worried anymore. You start with the worry, feeling vulnerable, you end up with, ah, solution, I'm one with God. I've, I've said what I want to see and I can release it now. So I haven't read the book yet, but I know that her goal in learning to live this way and identify and speak to the different parts was world peace. That's her goal. She just thought if people could just learn to use all of their brains instead of sticking with the scared part, we need that scared part. We need the part that uh, says lions and tigers and bears, oh my, you know, uh, because we, we need to protect ourselves in life-threatening situations. By the way, the tornado has settled down now, <laughs> so we survived that. And uh, But I think it's, it's a very cool to, way to think this is natural. This is a natural process. We were given a brain that works like this to help us through these times. So I think it's very exciting and very, I've been doing this treatment work for 40 years, but uh, you know, I still find I get stuck 
sometimes back here in the, the worry, worry part. And uh, this is a wonderful reminder that we all, all have this natural ability. Was there anything you had to say before we close, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> what? No. You talked a long time. I did. I oh, well, long. just poke me. Just yeah. poke me. It was interesting. We yeah. sit next to each other so we yeah. can poke each other when we want to say something. <laughs> No, I had, I had a really great thought, and like a lot of great thoughts, it'll probably be there tomorrow. <laughs> well, and, and okay. what I will say is, as you listen to, as I listen to Judith, or as we listen to ourselves, we're constantly processing information, and that processing is trying to make sense of this world we live in, so that we can live safely in it. What we need to be willing to do, as they talk about in AA, is turn it over. Mm -hmm. Turn it yes, over to a yeah. higher power. Turn it over to, the, to an idea that we, we can hold near and dear to us, that we're not alone, that this right brain you're talking about is, is, is God's channel through for us, and that we each have our own little YouTube channel. You know, you have one, I have one. And, uh, but those YouTube channels are in us that we can turn on, we can connect with, and when we turn that channel on, we not only connect to our brain, we connect to all brains and all consciousness that is like itself. And I know that that's true because I've had an idea uh, when I was in that part of my brain, that creative part of my brain, only to find out that an hour later somebody else had the same idea at the same time and they called me because they had this idea and they had no idea that when we're in that space we can communicate. How many great ideas and how much knowledge and mm -hmm. how much wisdom and how much healing happens because we say yes to it rather than we have to explain it and understand it before we can do it. So what I would end with today is we need to be willing to be bigger than we think we are. We need to be willing to know that we're all connected and that in some profound way, the universe is working in favor of us, not against us, and that we have the possibility of doing absolutely miraculous things just because it's possible. Exactly. And uh, so would you like to close us with a closing I'd prayer? be glad to, yes. So since we already are together, I won't ask us to come together, but what I will ask us to do is to reach a little deeper into that place in consciousness that knows the truth about our being. That place in consciousness that knows who we are is divinely connected, woven together with all the souls and all that is alive and all that is good and all that is in nature. And that we breathe not only the breath of life, but we breathe consciousness into our lives in a way that is unexplainable and powerful and wonderful and marvelous. So we take a moment now to appreciate the marvel of our own being, the marvelousness of our own being, the magic of our own being. And we say yes. We say yes to creating. We say yes to allowing more and more good to flow through us. We allow ourselves to be channels for the blessings that are necessary, needed, required, and desired for this life that we are living to be the best possible life. Knowing that this is done in the mind and is done in the mind of God, we say thank you. And together we say, and, and so, so it is. is. And now we're going to go to screen share because we have a message to share with you here. There we go. We're getting better at this. There we go. So uh, at this time, we just want to remind you that we are not-for-profit corporation and um, we are supported by donations so we appreciate your donations many of you uh, are set up to give regularly a, a, a definite way through our our website with the PayPal which is at the top of, of the website so ways to donate but uh, we just want you to know we appreciate that you you, uh, you source us you supply us and so let's say the affirmation that we believe. My investment today is made with the full realization that God is the source of my supply and returns it to me, enriched and multiplied. And this is what we believe, that we need to circulate our good uh, for it to grow. So we thank you and um, let's... Stop sharing for a moment. And then we're going to... Stop recording. <laughs>